Hello and welcome to Kiss My Arts. My name is Mary Blake <laughs> and that gets a laugh every time. I'm here um, with Leitrim Daly on the Arts Show and I'm very happy to have Seamus O'Rourke with me today. How are you Seamus? I'm great. You're very Thanks. welcome. Thanks for asking me. Sit down there till I interrogate you as I said. It's, it's great to have you here and you have a new book out. I have. Yeah. This new book that yeah. you've brought yeah. in I'm today. I'm flooding the market with another book, yeah. Fantastic, <laughs> that's it, that's it. And um, tell us, when did you start writing this book? Um, I kind of started uh, during lockdown. Um, I didn't start because of lockdown. I had decided last year to write a book and I had put this summer aside um, because summer's not the busiest time for the likes of me. And I had put the summer aside, and then in March, of course, uh, I had a tour lined up of a play, and all of a sudden it came to a sudden end. So I said, "Well, sure, I can get an early start on this, yes. on the book." And so I, so I had the best lockdown ever. You know, I was locked away in my uh, little man room at home and uh, got stuck in, and and little did I know that writing a book of this size. Well, is a marathon compared to the little sprints I would have been doing <laughs> writing plays. Absolutely. Uh, so I found it um, both exhausting and uh, really enjoyable at the same time. It was a very productive way to spend lockdown. Well, it was great. I was just really lucky that I had that to do. Um, and as I said, I had put that time aside. So it's not that I, I was missing out on anything apart from obviously my tour got turned down. But Hopefully that will someday come back. And interestingly, a lot of artists were saying that lockdown, even though they had the time, they really found it hard to, to concentrate because you do have that sense of doom around you as well, a little bit. Yeah, and there's also the worry of, you know, if I do this, what, how am I going to, um, you know, get it out there and what's, what's, what's going to happen? What's the longer, uh, what's the bigger picture? Uh, whereas... It, didn't really bother me. And I suppose, naively, we all thought this will only be a few months anyway. And, um, uh, standing gaps, is there? Is there? Is it the obvious reason that we It is. Anyone that? with any rural links will know that uh, one of your main jobs as a child was to stand in gaps and don't let them buy you. That's and it. <laughs> How often is it? Will that back. be every day? <laughs> every day. <laughs> uh, I, uh, um, it was just one of the titles that jumped out at me and I wanted... To write a book uh, about um, the very ordinariness of growing up in Leitrim. And uh, so that kind of sums it up. <laughs> and I suppose that would be a lot of people's experience growing up in, in rural Ireland, all, you know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. And um, a lot of people have said to me, that's a great title because they just remember that. Now, the book's not about standing in gaps, uh, it's, uh, but it's about that growing up. Yes, where we did, that experience. You know. of, yeah. And you're from Carrigallan? I'm from Carrigallan, yeah. Yes. Do you have to narrow it down a bit when you're in Carrigallan, or can you always say you're from Carrigallan? Are you well, a I've, bit out the road? I have, well, I'm out the road. I'm, I'm four or five miles out the road. And, a, and I'm only from Carrigallan, I suppose, from I was about 18 or 20, you know, where the book ends. Because before that, I, I'm from a place called Drumshangor, which is uh, kind of a... From Drumila, which is where we have a church and uh, we school. had a, sh a school and a mm. shop, and 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 that was where we were from. And we didn't really know where Carrigallan was because our world was so small at the time, and and uh, and Carrigallan they were townies in there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're far from townies really. So it wasn't until we kind of got we uh, uh, started growing up and had our own cars and we started going to town and mm. whatever that that's but um carrie gallon was is the parish yes you know i'm cl actually actually closer to newton gore than uh, carrie gallon right. but i always say carrie gallon Carrigallan. because i played football there i suppose yeah. okay and that's a very far so the farming and the football are very formative things in, in your life they're kind very of much so, yeah. very much made you who you are yeah 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 well there was nothing else um and uh, there was nothing else. You know, we didn't have it for a long time, didn't have a television. We had no outside influences, only a few kids at school telling us what was on Blue Peter or, you know, and we thought that was exotic. amazing. Exotic. And mm -hmm. uh, we knocked great fun out of watching the the card that to have on telly before it comes on. We would watch that for half an hour and just be in awe when we got Simple our first times. telly. Yeah. Yes, and, then, we... and then the clock came on, you know, which was... The countdown. The countdown. You were close. <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> and it's amazing because we, I grew up in a one one channel uh, home as well, and you'd find yourself watching uh, going strong and and, yes. and things that weren't yeah. for you at all. Not but at all. No, you had to, you couldn't be yeah, doing your yeah. homework. Sonny right? Knowles and all that. Yeah. <laughs> and even Bosco, even uh, though we were too old, we'd say this is. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, well, Wonderly Wagon was our, our big thing. Wonderly of Wagon, yeah, 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 that, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So come here, um, Carrie Gallen. You were fortunate, I'd say, to grow up in a place that really was one of the first places in rural Ireland to have such a theatre, th- such a beautiful theatre, and such uh, respect for theatre. Yeah, um, one of the things we did every year, uh, although we had uh, we weren't a social family. My dad went; he did all the shopping, so he'd go to town on a Saturday and get the meat, and then go for a couple of bottles of beer, and then uh, come home with the meat. Uh, which yeah. <laughs> which I failed to do as a as a father when I started going to town I would have more than two bottles of beer and no meat oh, but <laughs> no good there at all but one thing we did do was we always went to Carrigallan to the which was the Carrigallan community players back then and they were a very in, innovative group at the time uh, started uh, there was lots of people involved one of the main people was Father Patsy Young who had an influence on lots of little yes parishes around, around yes. Leithrop but he was way ahead of his time and so I I remember f- the magic of going to see those plays and there was a curtain down the back of the hall and behind that curtain was Eamon Daly doing the sound <laughs> and this amazing you know when you think about what he had to do to get sound he had reel to reel and then it was tapes and all sorts of stuff whereas now when I'm doing my sound uh, I love technology but I mean it's just a little flick of a button and you've got all sorts of sounds coming in and on cue and everything but and I suppose we don't need the skills that people like Eamon Daly need it at yeah. that time and, no. the, and the gear and the other thing was the play was supposed to start at nine o'clock and you'd go in at nine o'clock and there'd be nothing only banging and ripping behind the curtain and it was it just added to the magic because you would you kept thinking, what is going to happen when this curtain opens? And when the curtain opened, you had this amazing set, because Father Patsy Young was big into sets and all that sort of thing. And I remember plays where they had outdoor scenes, and I genuinely thought there was a, a, a breath of fresh air coming off the stage because it was so there was blue skies and clouds moving. And, and it was just, that was, at a very young age, uh, my introduction to theatre uh, and our plays as we call them then and it went on all night and we got a packet of emerald sweets which was a huge thing in our house and my father couldn't understand why we had to eat them all <laughs> at once that we couldn't keep them for some for tomorrow but you couldn't do that there was four of us we divided the packet up into four <laughs> Rationed and if there was an extra sweet we divided the sweet into four oh, like nobody could get an extra good. nobody could complain <laughs> but um so that i had a real uh, love for theatre but at, from a from a distance because I was a terribly shy child like we were all backward kids so I never had the uh, uh, wherewithal to try and get involved and then foot when I was you know a kid football took over and that was my whole life for a long time so I was 25 before I uh, put foot on the stage and that was only by chance because it was 1989, that's when the theatre in Carrigallon was built. I had access to a van, everyone knew I had, so they asked me would I bring the, they were after buying a load of second-hand seats for the theatre, and would I go to Drogheda or Dundalk, I'm not sure which, would I go and collect these seats. So that was my, um, they were really using me for my... <laughs> like, this is a big lump for lad, can yes. lug stuff around. And he also, he's a carpenter, so maybe he might get involved in the backs, uh, in backs stage for the theatre and I was mad to get involved and and Gus Ward my dear friend and mentor uh, was directing the play that first year and there was 35 in it so they were running short of people and he said would you there's a little tiny little part in this would you ever uh, do it and I said oh well I'll give it a try and I, as I say I was genuinely um, very shy and I've n- had never really done anything uh, uh, in public before apart from uh, we had a really good uh, Mocker and Affirmer group which uh, kind of brought us on a little bit too but anyway uh, when it came to my f- chance to do my bit on stage on the first night all of a sudden I realised I just love this 
and it was only about five minutes. I had to sing a bit of a song, and it was the most unsubtle performance you'll ever see. As you say, I was a big, strong fella, and I sang at the top of my voice, and I shouted my lines out good and loud. And uh, But when I came off, I knew there was something there that I had to follow up on. Something so, was awoken, really. Yeah, I, I, it, it was a, a real moment of... Um, uh, a, a light bulb moment, I suppose you could call it. Yeah, yeah. and 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 the the theatre opened on the same night because uh, the seats I was bringing was to this new theatre, and I remember walking into this into the auditorium which had been shaped and and tiered without the seats, and I went in, and it was like a, a one of these Greek uh, amphitheatres, yeah. and I just went, man, imagine being up there and everybody looking down on you and watching. And when I think back after, you know, one of my loves of, of playing sport was the performance has been on the field and people, you know, admiring you and saying, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. in my case, they didn't have much to admire. But um, the odd time, you know, it was it was part of that. It, it was an opportunity to show what you could y- do. Yeah, yeah. And that's a strange mix. You know, and I am uh, very often meet actors who are actually very shy people, but when they get on stage, that's their place and they light up. And, it's brilliant. And that's what happened to me. And, and the Cornwall is, is such a beautiful theatre. It's beautiful, yeah. It is really beautiful yeah. and everything works so well and the sound is so good. But I think yeah. what's really amazing about the Cornwall is the fact that it's so community. The community really have... have um, Access can can use it and avail of it and feel ownership over it. Yeah, and w- with there was a few times over the last twenty. Uh, what are we talking about now? We're talking about eighty nine, ninety, mm. ninety. So we're talking about thirty years. God, I'm getting old. Um, so uh, there have been a few times when we've had uh, paid managers and. Uh, and it's became a kind of going down that professional route, but at at the moment it's very much uh, ran within the community, and it's all everyone's doing their bit on a on an amateur level or on a uh, nobody's getting paid. And I think that's in a way that's a really good because, as you say, everyone feels that they're part of it, and nobody's above it, and we're all in it. And I love playing there, and I don't, you know. Uh, People keep using this word professional, but for me, I'm just doing a show with Carrie Gallen and yes. just. And it has that very traditional feel about it, with the chairs and and the curtains and the big stage and and, and you yeah. know, and it, it's just you've great people working there. You yeah, know. and and I have to say, you know, one of the um, designers uh, of the theatre, Cahill Farley, who's a lovely pub down there at sure. the moment, like he put a lot of thought into how the theatre should be. Uh, how it should feel and how uh, and the acoustics and all that there was a lot of thought it wasn't just by chance no. he brought in people who who had been involved in designing theatres before so um, th- there's a very natural uh, um, place there for for theatre and we don't always get it right on stage but but it is the, the venue itself is and it's ama- I remember going there around 20 years ago the kids were small and it was something I suppose Maura Williamson had been involved with mm. I, I don't know some kind of show and it was Brian O'Reilly was there as um, MC mm. and so he had the dicky yeah. and he was great and then as we were watching this it was very professional looking and the kids come on and he come on he'd very formally introduced the next one and then he came on after one act and he said here and she'd have caught the mother <laughs> and it made me really realise yeah. Carrie Gallon people uh, are doing this and their mothers did it and their kids yeah. and their grandkids will do it and yeah. there isn't th- although it's very much respected it's not a r- revered in, in such a way they're sitting there and they're munching their sweets and they're enjoying yeah. it and they're, yeah. they're and nobody taking themselves too seriously yeah. because that's uh, you'd be, you wouldn't want her you'd be cut down about Carrie Gallon <laughs> and come here you're a Cavan man now, Seamus. Oh, yeah, um, I am, yeah. No, uh, <laughs> of course, we grew up beside Cavan. Yes. You know, um, uh, we're only a, a mile from Cavan, and we're a mile from, or a couple of miles, a few miles from Longford as well. Uh, and when we were growing up, we always went Cavan direction because there was, uh, going back to the football, there was no foot, there was no team in Carrie Gallen at the time. So my dad uh, was. Always, him and his mates, him and his friends, they always went to see Cavan football. 
So we'd go to Breffney Park or we'd go to Ulster Finals. And I, so that was the, the direction we always went. So there was a kind of a, uh, a, a, a leaning towards Cavan. Now, as I got older, of course, I developed the same uh, passion against Cavan, you know, when we played them in football matches and, and there was that great uh, rivalry. So, um, but I also worked a lot from home as a carpenter years ago and I did a lot of work around West Cavan and I have great respect for Cavan people, but I am very definitely yeah, a litre man. Even though the ad for the ca- Cavan Cola yeah. was a bit... Now, we, had, we knew the Diet Coke man who used to um, wash the windows. Oh, right, yeah, Remember yeah. Remember that? Oh, ad? yes, yes. And everybody well, you see, so you're the answer to... Yeah, the, and, and there, is a, there is a section where I took off my shirt um, and showed my ribbed uh, frame... But funnily enough, it ended up on the cutting room floor. Oh, no. Yeah. I don't know what it was now. It's, maybe people didn't want to They'll see... They'll keep it for the same Maybe they didn't want to see Diddy's uh, in, <laughs> a, in a cab of cola. I don't know. <laughs> but um, we, I've done a lot of work with Porry Connolly, who shot the ad. And uh, I seem to be his, um, his go-to man when he's looking for a, a farmer. I have the old farmer's head on me oh, yeah. and, and the farmer's walk and the farmer's gimp. Oh, and, and I was accused a long time ago when I said I was in Galway one time as a young fella. I was still an amateur actor, but uh, there was young ones about. And I was uh, after doing a, I thought I was after doing a great job uh, in some play. And there was these young women about and they asked me uh, where I was from and what, what I did. And I was chancing my arm and I said, oh, well, I'm an actor. And they looked at me and they said, you look more like a farmer than an actor. And they were right. <laughs> there so, you go. So I had to embrace the whole f- uh, looking like a farmer. Now, I'm not a farmer. I've played lots of farmers. Uh, lots of farmers, yeah. yeah. And, and the thing about it is, at least I know what I'm doing is fairly authentic. It's the worst thing to see uh, an actor playing a farmer and he doesn't have the gimp of, of you know... Or, or, no, uh, he never stood in a gap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you have a company, Big Gorilla. Yeah. And where'd not, you get the name? Not very busy at the moment. I would I, say. Well, I'd be surprised if you were. Yeah. Big Gorilla <laughs> Productions comes from the day we were playing uh, years ago. I was near the end of my football career. We were playing uh, Drum Kieran in a match, and I had. Um, I was carrying a little bit of excess experience, uh, filling out my togs great. Nice. And some young fella came on <laughs> for Drum Kieran and I happened to run into him. Now, he must have been going in my direction because I wouldn't have been quick enough to catch him. But anyway, I, I ran into him and the poor fella, uh, he, he collapsed to the ground and uh, there was a huge um, the game had to be stopped. And they brought out all sorts of medics. Now, there was no medics, but people who had water and Sidon and they poured it on his head and done all sorts. But there was a very, a man, everyone will know who he is, was standing at the, at the goalposts. Uh, I had a bit of a beard on at the time. I was getting ready for some play. But this man roared out and he said, Rourke, he said, would somebody put that big gorilla back in his cage? And so, uh, so when I came to <laughs> deciding for a name uh, for the theatre uh, company I decided Big Gorilla I, I spelt gorilla a bit different as in guerrilla warfare yes. as in going to a place at night and setting up and surprising everybody and which uh, is exactly what you've been doing yeah and what I thought think is interesting because we've seen your plays in theatres and also in in community halls yeah like Leitrim Village where I live and I remember seeing your plays there and looking around the audience and I said I never there's people here I never saw in a theatre. Yeah. But there's something about coming to their own hall yeah. that they would do. And I don't know why, because they just, you know, they could just come in in the road to Carrick and Shannon and see it in yeah. the theatre. And some would argue, and they would have the proper seats and they would have the, yeah. the, the professional setup and all the mm. rest. But people like the... I suppose the mountain coming to Muhammad. Yeah, and it's it's not a, it's nothing new. I mean, the um, the fit ups were a big thing back years ago, and and McMaster's uh, fit ups and Harold Pinter performed in Mohol back years ago in a fit up uh, McMaster's fit ups. Uh, so it's it's nothing new. And I when I started out uh, naively, I be, you know, decided to go full time acting, and I, and I began to think sure. Who, where, who's going to give me a job? Like I'm going to be a long time waiting on a phone call. So I decided, well, I'll, 
I'll uh, get my own stuff together and, and tour it and see, see what happens. And, and in the beginning, a lot of the places I went were football clubs and it suited them. It was a fundraiser and they could s- sell the show. Um, and I just had all the gear and I went and I set up the set up for the show and did the play and, and, and I had a full house. And, and I, was, I was rehearsing a play in Dublin at, at some time early on when I had started in my company and I was chatting to a, uh, Ian Lloyd Anderson who's a, done great things for himself at the, um, in, on uh, all sorts of shows. But he was doing a show in the Peacock at the time and it was a Tuesday night and we went in for rehearsal and I, he's, and I had done a show in, somewhere in uh, Cavan or Leitrim at the time the same night. And, and I said, how did you get on last night? He said, oh, yeah, it was 25 at the play in the Peacock in Dublin. And he said, you were doing a show as well. And I said, yeah, there was 350 at our oh show. You know? <laughs> in a hall. So I'm not, I forget where it was. but And the strange thing is, you were right. Those people would not go to uh, the dock or they wouldn't go to the Rammer Theatre in, in Virginia. Um, but they'll go to support their own. And, and I very quickly realised that this was not, uh, in, in case I got run away with my own importance, this was not about me and about my show, although I'd like to think it added to the night and that people uh, identified with what I was doing and that they enjoyed it. But it was more about the whole social occasion of people coming out, meeting their neighbours and their friends, which is, uh, it's become a lot, uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't happen as often anymore. Uh, and they had a great night. And, you know, we're notorious in the theatre for uh, hanging around waiting for people to come up and hug you and tell you how wonderful your show is. But when the show is over in these venues, there's a mad rush to get the chairs stacked up for indoor soccer the next night. And it's a great... I I really love it because it, there's no well, bullshit. It's all just straightforward people, community people coming out, having a great night, having a cup of tea at half time. There's a raffle that goes on for about two hours that you're trying to, you're mad to get taken down your set and get away home for a pint maybe. Uh, and this, uh, and even to the extent we, there is a place, I'll not name it, but where the priest gets up and says a few prayers after the show, especially if there's a lot of bad language, he'll uh, kind of cleanse, time cleanse everyone out. before. <laughs> so, and it's, it's, it's such a, uh, a, a drawback to the old days, like when people went out for a good night and with the travelling show and yeah, 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 and a cup of tea and a bun, and there's no alcohol involved, or it's just socially uh, a great night out. And I think that it, we're seeing more now since, even with the, these new art centres that have come, thankfully, come around the country over the last ten years or twenty years. Um, they're smaller, they're smaller stage. So the day of the big set. Yeah. On the road is really <clears throat> gone. Yeah. And um, I see the likes of Fish Amble and Pat Kinnevin, these, and they nearly come in with a bag. Yeah. And set up a few things. Yeah. And that'll be it. And it's enough. It, it, you know, so often the audience can fill the gaps. Yeah. And I've seen you bring that to a whole new level when you're doing indigestion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I said, what is he that big van for at all? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah. all you had was one. Or two? Well, no, a concrete block. That was a it. Concrete um, block. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, I, I, uh, sometimes I kind of apologise for uh, being so sparse with setting, but then uh, I, I have to look very strongly at the play and say, what do I really need to tell the story? Because. You know, we, we we keep talking about drama and theatre, but really, what I'm doing a lot of the time is just storytelling and and how to. So how to tell your story as simply as possible. And as you say, let people fill in the blanks because you have to give people credit for uh, an imagination, you know. Yes. And, uh, and people really love when you ask them to come along with you on a, on a story, in a story. And, and, and they know where you are. I mean, I had another play, Porrick Potts Guide to Walk, and it's just a load of boxes yeah. stacked on top of each other. But people were kind of thrilled with themselves for knowing that oh you've created a little pub there and you've created this and um, because it's all part of uh, the writing the acting the directing but mm, the most important aspect of theatre is the audience and I think they deserve all our respect as opposed to uh, looking down your nose at them and saying 
look at what I'm doing. Isn't it wonderful? And I think that is exactly what you're doing. You're you're really um, understand your audience uh, and you're not patronizing them. And Mm. you're you're I suppose there was a time when we thought theatre was for other people who were smarter than us. And now we realize that all that the arts is really far Every one of us, every one, yes. one of us knows what music we like and yeah. what makes us laugh and yes. what makes us cry. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah. you know, it's something that... And we have to take away that whole thing of Emperor's New Clothes, you know, if you either like it or you don't. And, yeah. and, and if I go to something and don't understand it, uh, and, I've, and it has happened, and I don't, uh, I say, well, you know, I, I'm not uh, stupid. It's just I didn't see what the big... Hullabaloo yeah. was about, and I'm sorry, but I didn't yeah. get it. You know, uh, it doesn't happen very often. But, no, but, but sometimes there's more style over substance in yes, a thing. Yeah, and yeah. it can be beautiful, and it can be impressive, but it leaves you away. You, you don't come away thinking. Or yeah, and sometimes as actors, we, we we tend to show off our acting skills as opposed to telling the story. You know, which is. Um, uh, I get a little bit annoyed at that sometimes when I see, you know, you see people almost doing backflips on stage trying to tell a very simple story and all you want is the heart of it. And sometimes that's the bit that we miss out on and we, we do all the loops rather than go to the emotional exactly. side Exactly, and we don't have to be so very clever about it. Yeah. We can be simple about it. And I think um, your characters are... Does the character come first when you're writing your yeah. piece? Totally. It's always the character. Yeah. And the rest nearly writes itself, does it? Or do, yeah. do you well, have to keep bringing it I think the character back? and and the setting for a string, because um, it's really important in a play, I like to write stuff that you don't have to be, become too um, phony about bringing it from one place to another. So I, I love to find a place where you could actually play the whole play in the one place, So which means that 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 the play there's something within this uh place that can hold them there for for an hour or whatever you know what i mean mm. so there's partly t- um but me- mostly character yes uh but j- just going back to talking about act uh, you wouldn't want to be t- too um uh, dependent on on uh, 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 expecting people to say lovely things but I was doing a new play a few years ago uh, and I was really interested to hear what people might say and uh, you know give me some feedback and and it was I was going out a little bit away from my comfort zone with the play and when I was finished the play a man came to me and he said you didn't sweat as much in this play as you did in the last one <laughs> Was that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Did he want a pound of flesh? I don't know. I don't. I just and I. I wasn't very pleased at the time, but um, I can see. Uh, I know. But people do like to see you putting yourself out. You know, especially Aye. country people like to see you sweating a bit. You and, work. Yeah. They pay the yeah, tenor yeah. and no, they want I, to I see. I overdo it by times. You know, uh, there's a lot of um, certainly. I won't be allowed back too quick after COVID because the sweating and the spitting and the... It's yeah, not encouraged. You'd have to put up a glass screen in front of me, I'm afraid. <laughs> I know, I know. Year. Blood, sweat and tears. Um, but, yeah, uh, going back to the, the, the characters, uh, one uh, you mentioned a play there, um, uh, Indigestion. And that came about, I met a fella at a wedding, um, a friend of mine got married, and I met this fella at the bar, and this guy didn't know who I was, or, you know, so there was no... He wasn't trying to tell me a, a story so that I might use it. And you get a lot of that. People say, oh, I have a great story for you. And then you go, well, it's not that great a story. Mm. But anyway, uh, this guy started to talk. And I was just he was a big man like me. And, uh, and he just was so matter of fact about what he was talking about. And he had been to England. And, uh, and I just was fascinated with his character. And I said, there's a character that could tell any story, you know, because... We are a wonderful nation of storytellers, uh, and they're everywhere. They're not all on stage, you know. I know the best storytellers I know are just fellas who just are, you meet them in a pub or at a football match and they'll tell you a yarn, and, and it, it, you're just riveted, because it's a natural, it's an Irish, I'd like to think it's an Irish thing. I'd like to think it was developed around the time where I've the book set back in my, when we had Kayliers, or we called them Kayliers, people who came every night, and, and we passed around stories and with nothing else to do. Yes. Uh, and, and they were valuable people. They were people that were, um, I suppose, in our history, the, the, 
uh, you know, my father would talk about, geez, a man would come down and it would be great because you'd know he'd have a bit of crack. That's and, right. and you'd nearly all sit around and listen to him uh, yeah. un- unfold this old yes. story. Half of it could have been made up, I suppose. But, you yeah. know, it was entertainment for people. But it was also company and there's no, you know, we've, we've replaced a lot of things with social media now. But, you know, it's also, I'm talking about a time where people would come down their very long lanes uh, there'd be these would be bachelors maybe and sit along the road for three or four hours. Be- someone might be coming from town with a bit of news and they'd have a chat, and that's that was their day and that was their social media. Uh, you know that that was their interaction with the world because otherwise they were stuck in their house and they didn't have um, a television or a radio or whatever it was. So we used every excuse to go a Cayley, as I call it. Yes, um, it's called different things all over the place, but. Uh, uh, my father, <laughs> again, it's in the book. My father used to cut hair uh, around. Uh, he, he was a kind of a handyman, so a lot of people used to come to get their hair cut for free. To your house? Yeah. Now he was the worst man cutting hair ever. Uh, but he had the scissors. But he had the scissors, and he also had the little um, the hand uh, clippers. Uh, and he had a, a, a towel that he would throw around, and he drew blood. Uh, he did nick a few ears in his time, but. But this, because it was an excuse for people to come and there'd be stories told and, and they'd tell stories and he'd tell stories. And another neighbour of ours who uh, has appeared in, a, in the, he appears in the book, but he appears in the play as well. He used to come down to get his clock wound because, you know, his mother showed his brother how to wind the clock, but she never showed him. That was his excuse. And he'd come down with the clock? Every evening, yeah, to get it wound. Oh, God, who was he whining about? I mean, isn't that good value? Isn't it brilliant, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's gold, really. Yes. And that's his way. It'd be easier for him to come down with the clock than to come down and say, do you know, I'm a bit bored or I'm a bit lonely. Anybody, yeah, yeah. you know, and that time, it was a prop. Pe- that time people would, you know, you'd be, we'd be all out doing, working on, on the farm and you'd go into the house and there'd be a neighbour sitting there. They'd have come down, the door was open. You know, people come to your house now uh, and you kind of, you're going, what do you want? Or, you know, how long are you going to stay? Or is yeah, this... I ca- EastEnders is starting now. Yeah, and, and, and we all have this in, inbuilt thing. You know, if we don't look at our phone every 10 minutes, there could be an email from the president saying that we have just won a Nobel Peace Prize, and you don't want to miss that. No, it's um, madness. It is. And, I've, yeah. I, I, and I'm as bad as anybody, you know. You, you get really annoyed, and, mm. and you're chatting to somebody, and your phone, ding, and you go... And all of a sudden you switch off and certain people uh, um, in my life will say, oh, there you go again, I've lost you. Because I they have. Know. Yeah, and it's terrible. It is terrible. We've all let it slip in. And, yeah. and you know, our generation yeah. as well as our children's, you know, we have found ourselves yeah. a slave to it. Yeah, and it's, and I mean, I'm, I, in, in some ways social media has made me, uh, the fact that I can do stuff online and do it on YouTube has got me, an audience that I would never have got. Um, yes. So there's, there's lots of ups, pluses. lots of yeah. pluses to it. Um, and there are lots of negatives. And it's, it's, it's like every good tool. You have to be careful. And if you use it well, it'll work. But you could also cut yourself with it. So. Absolutely. <laughs> because you used YouTube really from early on in your, in your career. You've been putting the stuff up. Um, yeah. Happen, it happened by accident. But... Um, I was asked to do something for a GA website and I had no way of... I tried to send a piece about Leitham going to Crow Park. I mm. tried to send it via email and I realised it wouldn't, I couldn't send it and they said put it up on YouTube. And I hadn't... That's 10 or 15 years ago. Nice. I'd never put anything up on YouTube. So, And then all of a sudden, a week later, there was 50,000 hits on it and I went, all oh, right, so this is the way it works. You know? It was a, it, yeah. it really took I mean, off. The other thing is... At the same time, you can put something up and you'll get 100 people who will watch it and that'll be it. Yes. And you go, ooh, right. But it's a great barometer for you to know what's, what's working and what's yeah. not. Because you you've must have a million hits now on, on YouTube. Which a is couple of million, actually, yeah. And I don't mean way. to. Yes, yeah, um, with different stuff, yeah. Which is unbelievable. It is, it's mad. And I'd say a lot of them are watching it again and again. People do go back to most it. I'm not saying me, Most of them are me, actually. Yeah. <laughs> a million of yourself. We'll get to the bottom of it yet. But it, I, a lot of people do um, 
do watch your stuff more than once as well. The, they the do, character yeah, yeah. And they send it. It's a great one for being seen and then shared. I meet, I meet mad, like it's mad to meet, uh, meet people when you go to do a show and you meet this couple, you know, and we were watching you the other night in bed and I go, God, have you nothing better to do in bed than watch me? I you know. know. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? And some of your characters, I love Mossy Flood. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. He's yeah. so funny. And there's some of them, like Long for Tourism um, once in yeah, Stan yeah, the Wet yeah, Field. Yeah, and it's just, where did he come from? Longford, of course. Well, you wouldn't get him uh, in the uh, there was a No, you wouldn't, no. no. There's a uh, Longford, uh, I mean, I have great affection for Cabin and Longford, and, you know, we're, we're all the ones I was little mm-hmm. anyway. Um, but uh, there was a. There was some survey done a few years ago and it said that Longford was the least desirable place in Ireland to live, you know, uh, which is a bit funny because it's no different to Leithrim. It's a bit harsh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember waking up because it was on, I was just, I know lots of Longford people and I was a kind of, ah, you're going to take a while to get over this, you know, the stigma of being the least desirable place to live because it's usually Leithrim. And we've kind of, we're kind of a hipster place now, Leithrim, uh, I know who knew. Yeah, <laughs> but here we are. Yeah, here we are. yeah. but um, but the next morning I woke up and it was the most horrible, miserable morning. Uh, and I looked out and there was mist and we the land around me is terrible, rushy fields and whatever. And I just had this idea of you know coming up with a character saying you know that Longford isn't the most. And and I just thought of what is the most on uh, the, the the most. Uh, boring story you could tell and then I tried to think of what name will I give him and all that so it, it all happened really quickly and I went out with a tripod and a camera and I stuck it in the field about nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and I, I just uh, went for it and uh, I know. and they're always the best ones you and know? did you was that nearly improv half kind, kind of and I'm not I don't usually do that like I mm. usually am very scripted um, but it was I kind of knew what I wanted to say and, and I wanted to uh, I didn't. I wasn't too worried if he got a little bit mixed up in the story because that's the way it works that's anyway. That's the beauty of it. And the funny thing is, I was half. My mother's a great woman to tell stories. She's not a great storyteller because they go on and on, and she has to go into every detail. And she'd tell you, now he was wearing a green jumper, and where there's a green, kind of a green that. You'd, and she'd start looking around the room for something. So anyway, I was. Uh, it. The, the Mossy Flood thing, uh, the Longford tourism took off. So I, I showed it to my mother. And she said, oh, that's very like the day we were at Mass and the wasp came in and your brother, Kevin, he was asleep and the wasp... Were, and she told me the very same story in a, in, a, in a sense, you know. And I said, well, there you go. That's there you go. <laughs> and it is, I, I think he's just gas. He, yeah. he really is. You direct, do you direct your own plays? Sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes not, yeah. You had Barbara McKeeve in with you, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. For, yeah. What was that for? Was that for Auntie? And Auntie, my Aunt B. Aunt yeah, B yeah. yeah. And I had her for, uh, I did a play called um, From Under the Bed about That's two right. bachelors. And she directed that? She directed that, yeah. Where did the two bachelors come from? That was a great that's the, one. That's, that's the man that used to come to the house to uh, get the clock one. Get the clock one, yeah. And they, um, they, him and his brother lived uh, in a little cottage beside us. The cottage is still there they had no light or uh, the chimney was blocked uh, the smoke went out the door um, and they didn't talk to each other and they yes they put on a, a they made the dinner and one of them met off one side of the pan and the other fell out off the other side and uh, Eugene who was the uh, main character in the play I suppose um, he was a few weeks uh, dead before anyone found him uh, because they were always in town, or or you mightn't see them for weeks, and and um, and when we went, uh, we eventually a few neighbours we decided there's something wrong here, and we got into that. It wasn't hard to get into the house, but he was lying on a bed with only three legs, so he was a kind of lopsided, and uh, it was just such a sad end to uh, um, to a life that. I mean, in some ways it was very small, but it was such a colourful... They were such colourful characters, and uh, we had great fun with them. And So I, I suppose it was a lesson for me to uh, make sure that when you're living your life, you live it to the yeah. fullest of your ability. And even characters like that that you portrayed in the play, there was a fierce love 
but they didn't even acknowledge or anything and there was they could of kill course, other yeah and yeah. you know and, I, and we used our vocabulary in in rural ireland it has been was was very um uh, muted you know we didn't use things called love and we didn't no. say uh, that's my best friend or no. you know we didn't we, we, we um and we we hated the americans because they're all sh- shaking hands and hugging and and showing affection and we didn't like that no. um we, well uh, we didn't think it was terribly sincere either exactly well i think that's more important yeah. you know and and i always talk about um my mother and father's relationship and they loved each other to bits you know um but they never showed any of these there was no cuddling and uh, no. hugging and rubbing and no <laughs> and when my father uh, he had he had cancer and on his um his last breaths uh, he, he he was sitting out um on a sunday night and he put his hand out to my mother and he said i'm away best of luck and he shook hands with her and he died imagine yeah I know, isn't that amazing? It's a, it's, uh, but yeah. you couldn't dispute their love. Not at all, And the no. sincerity of oh, it. Oh, totally, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's something that, um, um, what kind of nigat are you? You know, you do talk about that. And, and I think we do see past the, the, initially you'd look at it and you'd see the hurt. Um, but I think we all see past it and identify with it and say, yeah, they, they had some way of not wanting you to get notions and, and yeah, smarten yeah. up and do better. The strange thing was a lot of those poems that, were, that I wrote and they were written when I was in my twenties, when I was having a, a kind of a difficult time with you were you were m- mad with your father for never giving you any credit for anything and he was always rubbing in that the fella down the road had a really good after buying a new van and you're driving around in a heap of scrap or whatever it is and there was always little rubs and and all it was I suppose was he was trying to you know push you on a little bit but it when you're young it goes the wrong way so a, a lot of stuff that I started to write I was writing with real anger and then as you start as you write you start to see the funny side of it as well and then that the humor enters and and then you see the heart of it too and, yeah. and um all that old guff was only that i have to say one of the nicest things of uh, i give my book it's it's out it's on release now but I, I i give it a few people um when i when it when i got the copies printed first and uh one man i gave it to and he rang me up a week later and he said you know he was delighted with the book and but he said it's a love story and i went and he said, it's a love of the people and the place and the time. And that, to me, was the best compliment I could, uh, could get. Because that's what it, that's what it is, really. Is, is, uh, and, and people have mentioned that word, affection. You know, I, I just, there's, uh, maybe I'm getting old and soft, but I, I just have this real affection for those people and, and the straightforwardness of them and the, and the simplicity, which is is great mm-hmm. and 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 uh, and we didn't have time for that new, almost new thing that's happening now which is depression which is you know such a serious matter and i i um thankfully i've never um suffered from from any of those mental illnesses in in a big way but i can understand where where that can come from so i'm a kind of all the more reason to celebrate the time when you know we didn't have it was a kind of it wasn't set up so much for it was set up more for survival than yes uh thinking overthinking situations but i can easily see how, yes. how and that, but but now i think we recognize it more the thing is there is help out there so we we need to make make take away any stigma involved yes. uh, with mental health but i'm just saying that uh, and i'm not saying that there was no mental health issues back then but 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 there was a, a, it was a very simplistic way of life we had and, yes. and it was very much getting from day to day. So Camille, your book is out now. It's called Standing in Gaps and it's a memoir and it brings us from your early childhood it brings me to before. where? It, <laughs> it doesn't bring you to today. No, it does not. No, no, no there's another one in you. No, I'm not. I'm not uh, I didn't. The, I didn't know where this book was going to bring me, and I didn't. I just knew I knew where it was going to start, which was at the very uh, because there's a, a very true, strange story. To, at my my mother's uh, is the first chapter. My mother uh, was expecting me. She was 
uh, my father decided to bring the car into Brewster's garage to get it serviced so that he'd be ready to bring her to Manor Hamilton because I was the first of our house to be born in a hospital. And my auntie, Peggy, was working as a midwife in, in Manor Hamilton Hospital. And uh, so the day after he brought the car in for the, uh, <laughs> in for the service, um, my mother's waters broke and she was ready to go. And he had no car. So he went up the road uh, to his cousin, uh, Christy Mimna, and they uh, headed off. And they brought me mother and Christy's uh, sister for company for my mother. And by the time they got to Manor Hamilton, she, the pains had eased and she was fine. So my father decided to bring Christy into the pub to treat him for giving us the lift, you know, and to have that done. So they went into the pub, my father and Christy went in. Above in Manor Hamilton? Above in Manor Hamilton. And they sat in and had a couple of bottles of beer and Mammy and, and <laughs> this other Peggy, uh, not my aunt, uh, they sat in the back of the car waiting for the men. Now, they were quite happy. And so that was the... That Wasn't, weren't they queer women? Oh, I'll tell you. My God. Yeah, when men were men. Huh? I know. And women were patient, maybe, to be doing that, because I can't imagine it happening No, now. I can't imagine and, the ones and, now. And you were telling me your mom then, you found an old cardigan from... Yeah, from my, my, um, from my uh, first communion, yes. yeah. And, and that was a cardigan your mother had knitted. She was yeah, a great yeah, knitter. She was a big knitter, yeah, yeah. She, and she was milking 11 cows a day by hand at the time. And Same knitting one. this as, as, a, as an income? Yes. yes. No, obviously, she had to do the cardigan for nothing, but uh, ah, yeah, she was yeah. knitting for a company down in Donegal, yeah. yeah. I've dedicated the... Uh, the fun, strange thing is most of the stuff I've written over the years has been about my dad, and, and he mm. features obviously a lot in the book, but I've, my mother features a lot in it too, but it's really about all the work she was doing. God bless us, she was, you know, Great were, women. those women were mighty, uh, uh, won, wonderful. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I was saying to somebody, I was coming in to talk to you today, and he said, he's, uh, he's like what Patrick Kavanagh would have been if he was better crack. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a nice one. Patrick Kavanagh, but he a bit grumpy. more crack. Pa- Patrick, so come yeah. here, we can get your book, Standing in Gaps, Seamus Work is a memoir, the first 18 years of your life. Uh, yes. Yeah. So when I started to write, I realised that I was very happy writing about those early, very early mm. years. And obviously, um, I can't be sure of ev- all the details, but there was some, I mean, we're talking about night from 1965. I was born in 1965. So uh, it was a very strange place at the time. And just uh, mm. so I was really comfortable writing about all that yeah. time. And then right up until my very short uh, time at school, you know, I left mm. school when I was 15, so... You had um, enough learned. I had enough learned. No, I had... Uh, yes. They couldn't teach me anymore. Poor yes. Eamon Daly has had his hair pulled out. He had lovely know. long hair when I met him first. I go away. Now he's as bald as a goose. Oh, coot, no, no, that's Poor all man. on you. <laughs> that's me. That's all on <laughs> and you. And Paul Williams. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and Kevin McManus. <laughs> yeah, he yes, all. he all tortured him one at a time. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. great. He was a wonderful so. man and yeah. a wonderful... a wonderful, I had a wonderful time at school. It that's, wasn't for you, but the book... Anyway, so you're still, no matter finished in school or not finished in school, you've two books. You've a lock of poems, recitations, and goodens, and that's a little book of his, um, of Seamus' poetry and recitations and goodens. And goodens. <laughs> exactly what it says on the table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then this beautifully uh, published book, um, Standing in Gaps, um, it's available on hardback as well from the website. So if you want to order the book from Seamus' website, Seamus O'Rourke, um, dot com and um, you can just order that and pay on PayPal or Stripe or whatever. You can also buy it in Masterson's in Carrigallen and the post office in Carrigallen and the Reading Room and Mulvey's in Carrick and Shannon and all good bookshops, independent if possible, of course. And um, no launch, really, because of... Ah, sure, there'll be no launch. No, no, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm quite happy with that because yeah. I never know what to say at <laughs> launch. You know. There you go. <laughs> it's there in you the go. book. It's in the book. <laughs> Read the Read book. The book. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to get that book sent to you, Seamus can send it off. It's also on, a, um, on an o- uh, audio download. So if yeah. you want to hear it. Which is interesting. Seamus was saying that um, a lot of people like, like the idea of listening to it. So it's on an audible called Aw Sound. Aw Sound, yeah. Is that a W O A W E sound. A yeah. all sound. All sound yeah. And um, you uh, you can also get the CDs. Anyone who has a CD player, they're very rare. CD thing. player. <laughs> so if you've CD player and you want to listen to this in the car, you, there's seven CDs and they've all got beautiful 
pictures on it and um, that, that really suited. So that would be something nice for people who are travelling and have a CD player. So get on Seamus's um, PayPal account there on his website, Seamus O'Rourke. It's been a pleasure to have you here today and to meet you and to chat to you. Thank I you very am much, very Mary. lucky to have the opportunity to chat to interesting people and um, grab them for a, an hour of their time. We've gone way over time, but I don't think anybody <laughs> will mind. So thank you very much. Is Thanks there anybody me, else you Thanks want to, s- anything else you need to hey add? Hey for sale. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> hey for sale. <laughs> hey for sale on the website. Oh, oh yeah. You always, post it. The farmers yeah. always say if you get a chance, you know, put up your ad for oh, hey away. for sale. Hey for sale. Yeah. So, lads, you heard it here. Hey for sale. And Seamus, thank you very much. And best of luck with the book. Uh, really looking forward to it. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for coming in.